Good afternoon, um, everyone. My name is uh, Christel van Steen from the University of Liège and uh, KU Leuven, Belgium. Um, our next uh, speaker is uh, Laura Furlan, and she's an associate professor at uh, Universitat Pompeu Fabra, UPF, and uh, is also a Miguel Servet researcher at the Hospital del Mar Medical Research Institute, IMIM. Um, she's heading the Integrative Biomedical Informatics Group of the Research Program on Biomedical Informatics um, in Barcelona, Spain. And she's really combining her background in biology and bioinformatics to develop bioinformatics approaches to identify and understand molecular mechanisms underpinning human diseases, possibly in relation to drug response. She's particularly active in systems medicine and systems toxicology, text mining, and knowledge uh, management. She has a long-standing record in EU project involvement, covering the former FP7 uh, framework program of the EU, but also the current age 2020 ones, including Alexis um, Accelerate. So, Laura, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Kirsten, for the nice introduction, and good afternoon to everybody. So, we'll start my uh, presentation of today, that is uh, titled Enable enabling comorbidity analysis from real-world uh, clinical data. So as uh, you maybe already know is that we are um, facing an increasing aging of the population worldwide and this has consequences at the, from the health uh, perspective. So uh, we are also observing uh, an increasing prevalence of chronic diseases and this also has an impact on the increasing prevalence of uh, disease comorbidities. And this can, uh, in a way, impact how uh, patient management has to be uh, um, achieved and also has an impact on the uh, treatment of uh, the diseases that are involved in comorbidities. But uh, let's start uh, having a clear idea what we talk about uh, when we talk about comorbidities. So there are uh, different definitions uh, in the bibliography and this depends on how we approach the problem of uh, comorbidity. So traditionally this was uh, approached from a perspective in which we consider one principal disease and the other uh, concomitant diseases as secondary or less important. And this first definition is more uh, in the spirit of this uh, perspective. So uh, traditionally on, on, on in the earlier studies of disease comorbidity, uh, the, the focus was on an index disease and then the other diseases were uh, considered as concomitant or uh, secondary to this uh, principal disease. And then there was another uh, perspective that is more focused on the patient, the individual patient, and all the diseases that co occur in each individual uh, patient without putting a special importance to one disease over the other. And this has a more holistic uh, perspective and in some way is the uh, approach that we uh, use for our analysis. Uh, notwithstanding this, I, for simplicity, I will uh, sometimes refer to the, with the term comorbidity, although we are studying more than two diseases, so different diseases that may co-occur in a given patient. Another important uh, aspect we need to consider when studying uh, comorbidities or multimorbidities are the chronological aspects. So in which time window we, we are uh, looking at the, in the whole patient history to define the multimorbidity or comorbidity. Because as you can uh, imagine, and this is illustrated in this figure, you can uh, observe the two uh, disorders or at the same time in the, in the patient, so they coexist, an uh, individual patient may have several diagnoses that coexist in time, or they can be, uh, they can be separated by a certain time 
uh, frame and in this scenario you might also uh, have situations in which one disease is the consequence uh, of the other. So there are different combinations, but the important thing here is that you need to have into account these uh, chronological aspects when you design a study and you, you define uh, what you mean with uh, comorbidity or multimorbidity. And not also this is the, the fact that in order to analyze or identify uh, comorbidity or multimorbidity patterns in a population, the time is really a key factor. And this is what one of the main message, uh, messages uh, that I want to convey to you today. Uh, so and why is it important to study this problem of disease comorbidities uh, nowadays? So I already presented that we are facing an, uh, an aging of the population and this uh, has increasing, is increasing the prevalence of comorbid diseases. And this, of course, has uh, great impacts in the healthcare. Uh, so there is a, a need to address this problem in a proper way in order to, to reduce uh, costs, and this is from a health uh, care perspective, but also to improve the quality of care that is given to uh, these patients. And it's also important to, to note that uh, the comorbidity is not an exception, uh, that uh, most of the patients uh, currently have one, more than one disease uh, when they encounter the, the clinical, uh, the healthcare system. Another important aspect also to consider is that whilst when we study uh, comorbidities, we can gain a better understanding of the uh, etiology of the diseases that are in place. We can uh, also identify uh, patients' uh, subpopulations that have uh, similar characteristics and even define new disease subtypes. And this is also very important uh, when we come to, to the problem of disease uh, classification and also has consequences for uh, trying to find out more effective um, preventive uh, approaches and even uh, designing uh, better and safer treatments. So I think the, the, the reasons why addressing this important problem in, in health are uh, quite uh, clear. So in our group, uh, we, uh, from some years ago, we are working towards helping addressing uh, this problem. Uh, by uh, developing different approaches and also by informatic tools that can be used for, uh, from one side to uh, identify and, and assess uh, the degree of comorbidity that uh, is available in, in patient uh, level data. And for that, we exploit uh, real world uh, data and also different types of omics uh, data sets. So the, the, uh, we, we are in a, in a moment in which the, we can access to different information uh, from the patients that describe their, uh, their molecular uh, features like genomics, proteomics, and, and so on. And this can be accessed from different uh, initiatives. And on the other side, it's important to uh, consider data that is captured from the, uh, the healthcare systems. And this is what I mean from re real world data. So data that is um, obtained uh, from the encounters of the patients with the, with the clinical system, the hospital, and that is recorded in the uh, electronic health records and other types of uh, records that are collected during the clinical practice. So it has been uh, demonstrated also in other applications. Uh, all the information we can extract from this uh, real world data and how it can be applied for, uh, for research, for, uh, of course, but also for translational applications. 
so uh, with this spirit uh, in our group, we have developed a series of tools uh, to, from one side, identify comorbidity and multivulnerability patterns from real world data. And these are listed here and I will uh, provide later a more complete uh, list with their URLs and also some uh, tools that help uh, gaining insight on the molecular basis of the uh, coexistence of diseases. But today I want to focus on uh, our approach for analyzing uh, temporal patterns on uh, disease uh, trajectories. So um, a little bit more about using uh, real world data. Uh, that is the, to, to mention some aspects that need to be taken into account. So from one side, this data is very rich and can provide a lot of information about uh, real patients. But uh, when working with this data, you have to be aware of some um, barriers or aspects that have to, that require special, special attention. One is uh, that uh, you, you need to know that this data has not been collected for research purposes. So it's different from um, a cohort database that you might collect with uh, a lot of attention to, to collect uh, very well specific information about the variables you are studying. So this is a completely different scenario. So you, you are working with data that has been collected for other purposes for, uh, of course, uh, patient management, but also in sometimes billing. So uh, the, the idea is different. And uh, from this, uh, knowing this, you have to deal with the data incompleteness. Uh, sometimes you will find errors or bias in the way data is registered that you need to know in order to uh, control in an appropriate manner. Other uh, things that you need to be to take care of is how the data is represented. Uh, sometimes the, the information is encoded and in different uh, using standards, but uh, depending on the data you work with, the, they will use uh, one standard or other, and different also different standards are used for different types of different type of information, diagnosis, medications, uh, laboratory measurements, and so on. So you, you need to be aware of all these aspects to uh, process your data set in, in an appropriate manner. And also is the issue of how the database you are working with, working with is structured. And also this is important when you plan to combine data coming from different data databases or different hospitals. So let's uh, then move on uh, once I have a, a, a talk about a little bit about working with real world data, how we uh, approach the uh, problem of finding uh, these uh, trajectories. So first let's see how we can represent uh, the information that we can obtain uh, from an electronic health record of uh, patients from a hospital, for example, in which we have uh, encoded the different diseases, so the different diagnoses that a certain patient can uh, have at different time points. And this is something you can uh, find in an electronic uh, health record or a, a patient registry. So the idea is to use this information uh, to represent a single patient. And we are interested in how these uh, diagnoses are uh, assigned uh, in time. So we can uh, define these uh, disease trajectories as disease history vectors in which each diagnosis is, uh, is ordered according to the, the time of di diagnosis. So the, uh, at the end, we have a time series, so at, uh, order sequences of diagnosis. And this uh, disease vector represent uh, an individual patient. So we can, if we have a database of patients, we can uh, represent each patient with this uh, with this approach. So each patient will be represented with this disease 
history vector. And then what we would like to do is to find, for instance, patients that are similar uh, among the whole database or even group of patients that share similar uh, disease trajectories in our case. So for that, what we do is to perform pairwise uh, comparisons between uh, our disease uh, vectors that represent the individual patients and we, with the goal of finding uh, what we uh, call the common disease trajectories. These are the trajectories that are uh, in which the diseases are shared among a minimum number of patients. Let's say we, we set the limit to uh, 10 patients or 100 patients. So in this way, we can identify these common disease trajectories that represent uh, sequences of ordered diseases that are shared by a number of patients. So if we perform this, uh, this uh, procedure for all our database, we will end up with a collection of uh, trajectories. And the next step then is, uh, can we identify uh, common patterns between in, uh, in, in our population? And for that, we will uh, we present a clustering algorithm that is based on uh, the dynamic type warping approach that allows us to identify patterns uh, of commonalities between our data, our disease trajectories, and assign them in different clusters. Uh, note that we, uh, our trajectories may vary in duration and in the diagnosis and the, and the order of the, of the diagnosis. And the clustering algorithm uh, is able to assign trajectories of different duration, different length in the same cluster, and uh, considering the similarities in, the, uh, in these individual trajectories. So uh, let's talk a little bit about dynamic time warping. So dynamic time warping is a powerful dynamic pro programming algorithm. Uh, that is used for measuring uh, similarities between signals or, or time series that can have different uh, lengths or speeds. And it has been uh, successfully applied to different domains uh, from uh, speech recognition and, and uh, gene expression and many other domains. And uh, uh, we propose that we, this can be used to identify disease uh, groups and especially for identifying disease, common disease trajectories. So uh, dynamic type warping uh, is a global alignment method. And uh, what it does is to calculate an optimal path between the two sequences by minimizing the total distance. So the way uh, it, it does it is uh, to try to, to compute an optimal path, the minimal path between the, the, the two distances. And in this way, it achieves a more intuitive uh, way of aligning the two sequences. So in a way, it, uh, it stretches or, or compresses sections of the sequence in order to find this optimal alignment. And this is done uh, despite these sequences might be somehow out of phase in the time axis. And that's why uh, this is a really a uh, suitable approach to apply with to these uh, disease trajectories uh, that I already uh, shown to you. So let's look at an example with the disease trajectories to see a little bit more how the algorithm uh, works. So we have uh, from one side uh, the two, uh, two patients represented by the disease uh, vectors. And so what we want to, to obtain is first this common disease trajectory that is obtained by comparing in a pairwise manner all the uh, diseases that are described in each uh, trajectory. And uh, we uh, do that also by uh, using a local distance matrix that uh, 
displays the similarity between the two sequences, the two trajectories uh, for each of the elements, so for each of the diseases. And the distance, uh, me the distance metric that we can use here for the diseases can be obtained uh, using different approaches that I will explain uh, a little bit later. So uh, we uh, compute this local distance uh, matrix and the uh, dynamic time warping actually works uh, by trying to find an optimal path that is shown here with this red line that minimizes the, uh, the distance between the two trajectories. So here in the local distance matrix, uh, the lower values indicates the more similar the elements of the trajectory are. So what, the, what we try to do is to find out this uh, path that goes from the, that minimizes the cost of uh, comparing the two sequences. So what we do is actually to obtain from the local distance matrix a total accumulated distance matrix and uh, the uh, value of the last element of the column actually is the uh, distance between the two uh, sequences and is the similarity metric that we will use later on in the clustering. And we subsequently, sorry, we subsequently uh, calculate this uh, optimal path between these two sequences and we align them to uh, uh, using this warping path. If you are interested, uh, I can give you some pointer. This is a nice example and very illustrative to, to show you how actually the uh, lo uh, local distance and accumulated distance matrix is calculated. If you are interested in explore a little bit more about dynamic time warping. So once we have obtained our uh, common disease trajectory, sorry, too fast, uh, we end up with trajectories of different lengths. So trajectories of length two, three, four, five, six, and, and maybe more. So these are sequences of di diagnosis that are shared among a certain number of uh, patients. So this represents our database. And what we want to do now is to uh, answer the question if there are similar patterns of trajectories that uh, we can identify. And for that, we, appro we apply this unsupervising uh, clustering approach based on dynamic type warping. So let's go uh, to explain how it works. So we have our uh, collection of uh, common diseases, common disease trajectories, and we will process iteratively uh, to obtain uh, our clusters. So the first uh, trajectory of the collection is assigned to, to first cluster and imagine that we, we repeat the process that we will go through uh, several times and we are in a, in a step of the process in which we already have three clusters and as you can see each cluster has a set of common trajectories that can vary in length but that they share some common uh, properties like diagnosis and, 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 and combinations of certain diagnosis over time. So we want to cluster the next trajectory. So what we do is we compute our, uh, using dynamic time warping, our metric of similarity between it, uh, my, my common trajectory and each trajectory of a cluster and we repeat this uh, procedure for all the clusters we already have. We then take uh, the average distance between uh, the trajectory and all the trajectories of, the, of each of the clusters and we identify the minimum distance. Uh, so we identify the clusters that might be more similar with my trajectory. 
And then we use a threshold that has to be heuristically defined in order to identify, to decide if we assigned the trajectory to this cluster. So if the, the average distance is lower than the defined, predefined threshold, or on the other side, if it's higher, we will end up by creating a new uh, cluster with this trajectory. So this process is uh, repeated uh, several times and until we are able to allocate all the trajectories to the clusters. So as I uh, mentioned before, the threshold has to be uh, selected and this is a, a, a iterative process in order to find a configuration in which uh, the clustering is not very fragmented but also we don't end with clusters that are very big and contain a lot of trajectories and, and therefore do not provide a proper separation of our data set. So we, we analyze all these uh, data, we uh, applying the dynamic type warping trajectories. So I explain how we compare the trajectories, uh, but at some point we need to define how we will compare diseases individual, individually. So what metrics of similarities we use for the diseases. So, and in this, in this, uh, in this regard, we can uh, these relate diseases from different perspectives. Uh, so, because uh, diseases themselves can be defined or expressed in different ways. So, we can, uh, in the clinical setting, the diseases are described and identified by signs and symptom, symptoms, and then. Uh, ultimately, they receive a code, a di diagnosis code, so we can use this information and the diagnosis code have some meaning, uh, meaning and are organized according to some terminologies. So we can use this perspective, the clinical per perspective. We can also describe diseases from uh, the genetic perspective by using the information that we know about their genetic underpinning. And we can also describe diseases from the uh, signs and symptoms uh, by which they are manifested. So uh, the phenotypic uh, manifestations or the, of the diseases. So uh, in our work, we use these three different perspectives. And of course, there are other perspectives that we can, or other data sets that we could uh, use to describe diseases. So for the uh, perspective that use uh, the diagnosis, so the definitions of the diseases, we uh, uh, derived a similarity a metric between uh, diseases that is uh, based on the uh, terminologies, so the, the hierarchical organization of the concepts in these terminologies. And for this, we use the Unified Medical Language System that contains a metathesaurus of concepts uh, that cover all the uh, domains of interest in, in biomedicine, but in particular, they have some uh, subdomains that pertain to diseases, and they have a, high, a really large collection of disease term terminologies included and they organize each concept that would represent a single disease in a hierarchy of ESA relationships in a manner that we can have a, a, a particular disease and, and this is related to a more general disease description uh, and it also uh, to similar disease description. So we, we can exploit this organization of the of the terminology to uh, address in a more semantically aware way the similarity of the diseases. So the idea is that if you, we are comparing, uh, for instance, two diseases that belong to the cardiovascular system, uh, we will assign them, although they are different diseases, we will assign them 
a higher similarity value than uh, if we compare uh, cardiovascular disease with a neurological uh, disease. Uh, and this is a representation of uh, these concepts in the hierarchical structure provided by the UMLS. And we apply uh, metrics that have been implemented to exploit the topology of the uh, ontology, the, the terminology, in order to assess uh, the uh, similarity between the concepts uh, using uh, information contact metrics and, and and the and explores the the depth of the of the ontology so the other metric that is based in the uh, genetic information is based on uh, obtaining a list or sets of genes that are associated to the diseases uh, that we are uh, studying and for that we use uh, the disgenet platform that is a platform uh, developed by our group that integrates information on, on genes and variants associated to human diseases. And in this way, we can obtain for each disease of the trajectory, a list of uh, genes that have been uh, studied in association to, to the disease. And what we do then is to apply a jacquard index to uh, assess the similarity of the diseases based on these uh, gene sets. Laura, for um, a question that is uh, asked by several uh, members. Yes. Um, so it's about uh, for finding common disease trajectories. Mm -hmm. Do you incorporate similarities between unequal diseases and how do you handle the time difference between the diseases? Well, yes. So, so I, I'm explaining now how we compute the similarities. So, okay. um, Yes, we, we, we use these three different metrics that I, I have to explain now the third one. Mm -hmm. So, and, and then you will decide if two diseases are similar or not. And mm -hmm. this is defined by this metric. Um, and the time distance uh, is, cons so the time factor is considered when we aligned the entire trajectories. So okay. the, the distance between diseases is used to compute, to, to make up the local similarity matrix that compares to disease trajectory. And then the, the time dimension is used when we compute the, uh, the similarity between common trajectories. And this is used for the clustering. Okay, thank you. So I hope this clarifies the questions. If not, we can then uh, yes, uh, comment more on this. So I have explained that, uh, um, so maybe to clarify, we have, uh, so we have all, all this process to compute the, the, to obtain the common disease trajectories. And then once we, we have the common disease trajectories, we have, uh, let me see if we can, Go here. So, okay, so I, I'll, I'll continue from here. We have this, uh, once we have this, we want to cluster them. But uh, a very important point, in fact, is this, how we define the similarity between diseases. So we, we implemented three ways to, uh, to compute the similarity between diseases. So uh, we have this uh, based on diagnosis and the meaning of the diagnosis. We have uh, the one based on the genes. And now we also use one based on the uh, phenotypic des descriptions of the diseases. So, okay. So for that, we use the human phenotype ontology. Uh, as uh, this is a resource that provides uh, descriptions of phenotypes for uh, diseases. So each disease can be represented by a vector of, of uh, phenotypes. And at the end, what we assess is the similarity between the two diseases by comparing the, the phenotypes. 
and we also exploit the the in fact the ontology that organizes these phenotypes according to is a relationships when we uh, compute the similarities between the diseases and for that we use a uh, best match average approach for combining these two pieces of information so to sum up uh, at, the, at this point we by by what i explained before we uh, we we obtain the common disease trajectories and we use dynamic time warping to uh, for the clustering and we use dif three different metrics to obtain the um, similarity between each individual diseases and uh, this uh, then uh, are, are approaching the problem from different perspectives from the, the meaning of the disease the genetic information and the phenotypic information uh, so what I want to show you now is an example of the application of the methodology. So how it, it looks like and what, what we can actually achieve. So we uh, have an example uh, of for uh, in, the, in the area of cancer, in particular prostate cancer. Uh, and we did a study to I try to identify which are the uh, comorbidities of prostate cancer and for that we use a health registry from a region of Spain. Uh, the first step is to identify those uh, patients, uh, these are our male patients that are diagnosed with prostate cancer and this is uh, the actual three level digit code uh, according to ICD-9 uh, terminology that is the one used in the, uh, in the registry and we end up with uh, 21,000 uh, patients diagnosed with prostate cancer and then we applied uh, our approach uh, to identify those common uh, shared disease uh, trajectories uh, so this is a summary of the trajectories that we identified from this uh, registry. So uh, we uh, identify trajectories of length two, so that have two diseases, three, four, five, up to six. And these are the number of trajectories that uh, pertain to each category. And these sum up to a total of uh, a little bit more 2,000 trajectories. And these are the set that we then uh, used for uh, the clustering algorithm using the three metrics that I have already uh, described for the dynamic time warping. And this is a little bit of summary of the results that uh, we obtain. So for the, the semantic or clinical, we obtain 86 uh, clusters for the genetic 41 and 82 for the phenotypic. And these are the mean number of patients allocated uh, per cluster and the mean number of trajectories allocated uh, per cluster in each configuration. And let's explore some of the uh, results that we obtained. So um, here I show some of the more uh, populated uh, clusters in terms of patients. So the first one is the one that we call the metastasis cluster that has is formed made up of uh, by 6,500 patients. Uh, this cluster uh, contains trajectories mainly of length uh, two, two, sorry, as you can see, starts with uh, prostate cancer and then progress to metastasis to different organs and systems. And uh, we can see here that this uh, trajectory is the one that is most populated in, in the cluster with a larger number of patients. Another interesting cluster was uh, the one that we named the COPD, the Chronic Obstructive Pulmonary Disease Cluster, uh, that contains a diagnosis, a first diagnosis of prostate cancer followed by different diseases that are part of the COPD uh, definition. And again, 
these two diseases were the one that the trajectories that were more populated in this cluster. It's important to know that uh, COPD uh, is a disease in which smoking is a respiratory disease in which smoking is a risk factor and, uh, and for prostate cancer it happens also that smoking is a, is a risk factor and also this uh, COPD is a predictor of uh, mortality for prostatic cancer patients. Uh, the next cluster is uh, uh, one that has uh, diseases uh, related to neurodegeneration and, and this also was quite uh, interesting due to the large number of patients that were allocated to, to these trajectories and, and cluster. And finally there was another cluster in which we find several uh, different types of cancer that then uh, lead to uh, prostate cancer and the one that started with bladder cancer uh, was was the one that the trajectory that was more, more uh, populated so this uh, configuration or these clusters were extracted from uh, the cluster configuration in which we use the uh, clinical the semantic information of the diagnosis so it's, it's a way to, you, know, in, you can see that we can organize the different uh, cluster, the different trajectories in different clusters and identify different patients, uh, subpopulations that follow a different temporal um, order of diseases. Another example that I wanted to show before we finish is, uh, different uh, clusters that have uh, similar diseases that were obtained using the different measurements so the clinical the genetic and the phenotypic uh, if you see for instance you compare these two uh, clusters they contain uh, similar diseases and these were obtained using the different metrics uh, but are, there are some diseases that are not shared uh, and this has several explanations. Uh, it has to do with the genetic description of the diseases or how these uh, diseases, disease codes are, are defined and organized in the, in the hierarchy. But the fact that some associations are found uh, using the different configurations are also supportive of the, of the associations that are found. And also it's interesting to note that when you use the phenotypic similarity metric, the cluster is larger in the sense that it contains different uh, trajectories, but most of them are also associated somehow with um, kidney problems. So to summarize uh, the conclusions of, of what I presented today, uh, the main conclusions is that uh, we have developed this systems medicine methodology for identifying disease patterns from patient disease trajectories. Uh, this approach uh, study associations or similarities between diseases from three different pers perspectives. And it's also important that we introduce this, uh, the factor of the dimension of time into consideration uh, for the clustering algorithm. I, I also want to stress that this approach for uh, clustering using dynamic time warping that as you could see is an unsupervised learning approach, it can be used not only for uh, for the case that I presented for disease comorbidity and disease trajectories, but to uh, classify an heterogeneous patient population in different groups by, uh, by using different types of data that we could have uh, associated to, to this uh, patient population. And, and in this way, I encourage you to, to try it, to use it by your own uh, applications. So all the work that I have presented has been published uh, uh, two years ago and this uh, publication is mainly, this work is mainly done by a postdoc in my group, Alexia Gianola, 
And also I have presented some results that are not published. It's a manuscript under, the re under review and the code is available in this uh, GitLab uh, repository. And finally, uh, we have other tools, as I mentioned before, that can be used uh, for the study of comorbidities that are listed here. And with that, I, I finish the presentation and I'm really happy to take uh, more questions. Thank you very much. Are there questions from uh, the MLFPM? We do have a few questions uh, via Slido. So, um, does the warping method assume that the two trajectories being compared span the same time frame, or can gaps be introduced at the starts and ends? Uh, the, the trajectories do not need to have the same length, and this is really important point. So you can uh, cluster or compare trajectories of different di duration. And in fact, the algorithm is able, the dynamic type algorithm, dynamic type warping algorithm, in fact, is able to uh, deal with these uh, differences in length and differences in the elements. In, in our case, the elements would be the diagnosis, but can be uh, different elements of that make up the signals. And it does this by stretching or compressing the, the signal. So you, you actually do not introduce gaps as in other algorithms, uh, but actually really stretch or compress the signal in order to align them. But yes, it is uh, actually uh, very good for these kind of signals that differ in length. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And does the algorithm uh, allow for multivariate time series, so multivariate responses? Well, this is a good question and uh, we haven't tested, uh, but I think there are examples in other areas that have been applied for, uh, mm -hmm. yes, yes, but we haven't tested, but this is really a very interesting question, yeah, indeed. I think there is also a question from uh, Thomas Gumpsch. Yes, hello. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hello. Thank you. Um, Thank you for the talk. I have a question about the representation of the disease trajectories. Um, you mentioned it is a time series. So um, if I assume that a patient is in a hospital and there are several disease codes for that patient during the hospital stay, and then there's a gap, and then there's another hospital stay, then comparing this disease trajectory with another patient, the last disease code that this patient got from the first hospital stay would it be then forward filled for the entire uh, uh, gap? Because uh, then this disease code would have a higher weight compared to the other disease codes the patient got during that hospital stay. You get? I don't, I don't okay. think I get the question. So okay. we, we, so each diagnosis, so we don't uh, assign weights to the diagnosis. So it's, uh, the only thing we, we actually do is uh, if a diagnosis is repeated over time in our method, we make an assumption on, we only take the first time a diagnosis is made. So if this diagnosis is then assigned uh, another time, then, and this happens, we only take the first time the diagnosis was made. But I think this okay. answers, uh, doesn't answer your question. So. Yes, so I think I've understood that. From my understanding, if you compare two uh, time series with dynamic time warping, mm -hmm. then um, the time difference also matters. So there's a time difference between the last disease code of the first hospital stay and the first disease code of the next hospital stay that is also, is also part of um, the dynamic time warping difference to mm -hmm. a different uh, uh, patient trajectory. Yeah. yeah. So the order in which the disease codes during the first hospital stay are assigned matters in that sense, right? Mm -hmm. But yeah. maybe maybe this is too too much detailed. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, no. I mean, it's, this is important. It's important, and this is something we we also discussed internally. So. Uh, 
uh, the, in the algorithm at the end tries to match the, the diagnosis irrespective of the time gap between them. And sometimes this time gap is, is something that is interesting. Uh, yeah, it, it, it tries to map uh, them irrespective of the time, uh, of the time duration. Uh, yeah, but I, yes. All right. Okay. okay. That, that answers it, it, my question. That's an interesting point. Thank you. Right. I have here another question. Um, so this warping algorithm struggles with performance in big data. Could you explain how you manage to handle it? Just, just well, we, we didn't have a lot of problems with uh, big data, so uh, we yes, the, 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 this example is not really large uh, database, but we in the in our publication we have a population of five hundred uh, individuals, five hundred patients, and we we managed to compute the the trajectories in a normal work, workstation in a reasonable time. So the, the step that is more demanding computationally is the first step of comparing pairwise the individual disease trajectories. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is, yeah, with uh, actual computers, not a problem. Yeah, we have also a question from Zuki Lee. Zuki? Uh, yes, yeah, hi, Laura. Hi. Uh, thank you for the very insightful talk. So uh, my question is, do you consider uh, integrating the three similarity metrics? And if not, if not, uh, how do you choose in practice out of these uh, three metrics? Well, this is a really nice, interesting question and something we are really uh, struggling how to combine them because this would be really the interesting thing to combine in a single uh, clustering configuration the three or even more but actually we haven't come out with a <laughs> nice solution but oh, this would be right. the, yeah. the best you. because now we have this yes three different cluster configurations and no one is uh, is better than the other and each one has their limitations so it would be good to combine actually to overcome the biases and limitations of each of the metric. Yeah, okay, yeah, thank you. Has it been investigated to what extent the ordering uh, in a trajectory has an impact on the final results? So the actual question was, does the outcome of the um, warping clustering depend on the ordering in which the comparisons are carried out? We haven't uh, thought about this, no. Mm. No, no, no. Carson, do you like to say something? Thank you, Crystal. Laura, thank you for, for a very interesting and, and stimulating talk. Um, I have one question about this clustering on different modalities or different views of the data. So clusterings often end up in local optima. Clusterings are very parameter sensitive. Mm -hmm. So while I fully trust in your results, I think if, if the field at large uh, does these kinds of analysis, there's a danger that people tune the parameters, tune the, 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 the initial configurations of the clustering mm -hmm. until there is some overlap between the yeah. different modalities um, here. So do you see like a systematic way or a proper yeah. way how to avoid this kind of fitting the clusters, I would think. Yeah, th thank you for the question. I, I, I didn't show some interesting <laughs> thing that, that, that has to do with your question because of, of time, but we actually uh, implemented a um, clustering evaluation metric in order to assess uh, the homogeneity of each of the cluster in terms of the trajectories that are actually uh, end up in the cluster. Uh, and we compare them uh, according to the how similar are the trajectories among them, so the trajectories that are in a cluster, and we have a similarity metric in this sense, and another similarity metric that is more focused on each trajectory in order to find out if uh, in an individual trajectory the diseases that are there have something to do or not. Uh, but 
uh, yes, we implemented a metric to actually evaluate the clusters. And uh, in fact, we select the threshold for the clustering algorithm, taking into account these uh, metrics uh, for each of the configuration. But as you know, clustering and supervised clustering is something quite tricky to fine tune the parameters. And yeah. <laughs> But we, we implemented this metric in order to, in a manner more objectively, uh, select the threshold of the uh, clustering and also evaluate the homogeneity of the clusters that we obtain. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you again, Laura, for this excellent uh, talk and uh, to all who participated in uh, you know, asking questions. It was a nice discussion, I think. Thank so, you very much.